Oh, thank you very much, Judith, and uh, thanks for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, so as Judith mentioned, I'm going to talk about primary volatiles in layered ultramafic intrusions and uh, their effect on nickel-copper PG mineralization. And as always with these kind of things, um, it's by no means a, a one-woman show. I've had help from people who are too numerous to name, um, but particularly I'd like to thank my co-authors and colleagues listed here, so Ian, Bianca, Dom, Brian, and, uh, and Jock with their help with this work. So I thought I'd kick off, Judith's kind of stolen this slide already, but um, I thought I'd kick off by just explaining how I ended up looking at fluids in ultramafic intrusions. So um, as Judith men mentioned, I did my undergraduate and my master's at University of Southampton, actually doing my master's looking at a magmatic sulphide copper nickel PGE deposit in the far north of Quebec, um, which also involved my most attractive field gear time uh, because of the number of black flies around there. Um, and then for my PhD, I thought I'd do something a bit different, and so moved on to hydrothermal ore deposits. And in particular, I was looking at um, the Scurrias porphyry deposit in Greece, which is enriched in platinum group elements. And so that kind of kick-started my, I guess, overarching research interest, which is how do precious metals and semi-metals behave in high-temperature magmatic hydrothermal systems. And then after my PhD, I'd, uh, I'd had enough of the pesky fluid inclusions, and I thought, you know what, I want to go back to nice dry rocks, nice orthomagmatic systems. So uh, I went to do a postdoc looking at the Bushveld, but as you'll see a bit later on, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, so I'm part of the TEAS Consortium, which uh, is an amusingly named group of universities, a group of researchers in the UK looking at critical metals. So NERC, which is our UK funding body, um, is funding a lot of research at the moment into securing supply of metals which are needed for green technology, but um, for which there's a restricted supply. And so our particular consortium is looking at tellurium and selenium, which are not the most well-known of elements, but um, they're both semi-metals, and they're used in solar panels. And uh, they're, so they're particularly of interest because they're used in green technology, and currently all of the tellurium and selenium produced comes as a byproduct of copper mining and particularly porphyry copper deposits and so there's sort of our research has been looking at finding ways to broaden the supply of that um, of these critical metals now you might find it a bit bizarre that i'm opening a talk on pge mineralization talking about tellurium and selenium but actually one of the reasons why we're looking at the bushveld is that tellurium and bismuth commonly form minerals with platinum group elements so a lot of the platinum group minerals also contain bismuth and tellurium. So when we're looking for potential new sources for these critical metals, actually um, ultramafic hosted uh, magmatic sulphide deposits are a fairly good bet. Another useful thing about uh, magmatic sulphide deposits is they're commonly enriched in bismuth. And uh, recently there's been a sort of new technological development. And these little things here are bismuth tellurium thermoelectric generators. So actually, tellurium and selenium, although they're mainly used for solar panels, um, there are various other elements which can be used for solar panels instead. So whether tellurium will be a critical metal as far as solar panels are concerned in the future, it's kind of up for debate. But um, these things, however, means that if this technology takes off, there'll be a surge in demand for tellurium and bismuth. So these little things basically take heat and turn them into electricity. And so one of the potential uses is you could put one on a laptop battery and then it would take any waste heat from your battery, feed it back in as electricity and partially recharge your battery. So that's pretty cool. So having talked about my critical metals, I'm now going to talk about PGs for the rest of this talk. Um, but that's sort of the rationale behind why the TEAS Consortium is looking at these types of deposits. So I'm going to be talking about magmatic sulphide deposits. And in these deposits, the platinum group elements are hosted either in sulfides or in platinum group minerals, which, as I said, is also where our bismuth and tellurium is. And this has predominantly been thought of as a dry process. Um, so at its absolute simplest, just a, a refresher, um, you have an accumulating crystal mush and something causes sulfide saturation. So you get an immiscible sulfide melt forming 
And these little sulfide melt droplets partition any precious metals um, in the system into them, because precious metals would much rather be in a sulfide melt than in a silicate melt. And then as the temperature cools, our sulfide melt differentiates. So at around 1,000 degrees C, it differentiates into a monosulfide solution, which is predominantly iron and nickel, and a copper-rich um, uh, sulfide liquid. And as it continues to cool, uh, importantly, at around 900 degrees C, we think, um, often if there's enough semi-metals in this sulfide melt, you'll get a semi-metal-rich liquid exolving out. And this semi-metal-rich liquid tends to be where our platinum group elements, particularly palladium and gold, partition into. And uh, I'll come back to why this temperature is important a bit later on. And then as the uh, system continues to cool, you get your classic kind of pentlandite, pyrotite, chalcopyrite um, sulfide assemblage with platinum group minerals, which are just the solidified semi-metal melt here, which tend to be hosted either within or immediately, immediately adjacent to our base metal sulfides. But the question I'm interested in is what happens if during this process our host intrusion is also assimilating reactive country rock, so something like a dolomite, and this reactive country rock is giving off volatiles. So actually, is there a role for volatiles in this so-called orthomagmatic process? And this is by no means a new question, so um, there's been, this has been debated for many, many years. So in the late 80s, there was um, a lot of interest and a lot of work looking at the Bushveld hydrothermal system and uh, the identification of some fluid inclusions in quartz around the Marinsky Reef and other um, features which were thought to be of hydrothermal origin sort of kick-started this debate. And so on one extreme, you had people saying, actually, all the mineralization in the bushveld is hydrothermal. Everything's hydrothermal. And at the other extreme, you have people saying, no, there's no need for fluids at all. It's all purely orthomagmatic, and all these features can be explained by orthomagmatic processes. And to be honest, most people actually hold an opinion that's somewhere between those two. But this debate has rumbled on ever since, and uh, there's been various work done, not just on the bushveld, but on many other layered intrusions, looking at this question of, are there volatiles present? And if so, what is their effect on mineralization? And how important are they, or otherwise, for our PGE mineralization? Now, I'm by no means going to try and answer, uh, you know, solve this whole debate in the next sort of half hour or so. But instead, I'm going to focus on three main questions. So first of all, is there actually evidence for, for the presence of primary volatiles during the formation of magmatic sulfide nickel copper PGE deposits in layered intrusions? Now, I'm going to talk here just about primary volatiles, so I'm not talking about low temperature secondary hydrothermal alteration or remobilization. I'm just talking about volatiles which were present while the system was still at least partially molten, which realistically means temperatures of sort of 850 degrees and above. I'm also going to focus on, on sort of primary observational evidence. So there's been an awful lot of work done looking at geochemical indicators, so things like um, halogen ratios and appetites and other geochemical um, signatures that might indicate the presence of volatiles. However, I want to know is can we actually observe these volatiles, which essentially means fluid inclusion studies. Can we see these volatiles trapped as bubbles in the minerals? Um, I'm then going to talk about what effect this might have on mineralization, and then finally touch briefly on the practical implications of this for processing and exploration. So I'm going to start off by talking about a case study that I've been working on in my postdoc, the Aurora um, Nickel Copper PG deposit in the northern limb of the Bushveld. I'm then going to widen it out and look at other layered intrusions around the world where we might see similar features and then come back to the northern limb and talk a bit about the practical implications. So um, I'm used to giving this talk in the UK where I have to tell everyone that this is the Bushveld complex. Um, I'm sure you guys are, are quite familiar with the, the Bushveld complex. Um, but um, I just want to point out, so this is uh, um, Ian McDonald accumulated this data, and these are the metal proportions in the magmatic sulphide deposits in the western limb, the eastern limb, and the northern limb of the Bushveld deposit. And at the moment, there's a lot of exploration interest in the northern limb, because unlike the western and eastern limbs, these deposits are palladium dominated. So um, as some of you might know, unfortunately, platinum price has been dropping uh, quite significantly recently, but actually palladium price has been rising and recently surpassed that of gold. So there's an awful lot of interest in these deposits up here due to their um, slightly unusual metal proportions. Another good thing about the northern limb from an exploration point of view is a lot of the mineralization is actually very shallow and so can be mined with open pit um, mechanisms rather than underground, which makes production costs a lot lower. 
But the northern limb's also interesting from a scientific point of view. So unlike the rest of the bushveld, the northern limb intrudes reactive country rocks, so particularly including the Malmani Dolomite. So this is a sort of simplified geological map of the northern limb, and this unit here is where the Malmani Dolomite outcrops at surface. Um, and this sort of dark green here is the main zone, light green is the upper zone, and then here are our bushveld granites here. And so the fact that we've got, the, we've got our um, Rustenburg layered suite intruding and assimilating reactive country rocks makes this the perfect place to have a look at this question of what happens if there are volatiles around while these deposits are forming. Another interesting thing about the, uh, the northern limb, so the main, I guess the main mineralization in the northern limb is the, is the flat reef, um, which is this red dotted line here which is thought to be in the upper critical zone or the equivalent. Um, but there are also other deposits further up in the Rustenburg layered suite stratigraphy within the northern limb. Um, and these include Moordrift to the south down here, the Waterberg PTM project, which I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about later on, but Marina and Judith have done a lot of work on this, and the Aurora project, um, which I'm going to be talking about for the next few minutes. And these are hosted in leucocratic rocks and um, are thought to be sort of in the main zone, upper main zone, to maybe upper zone. And this is very unusual. We don't see um, PGE deposits at this layer in the stratigraphy in the western and eastern limbs of the bushveld. So the Aurora project is uh, up here. It's a, it's a nickel copper PGE magmatic sulphide deposit, um, also with a significant amount of gold. And um, unlike sort of, I guess, more traditional bushveld deposits, it's copper and gold rich. It's also palladium rich. Um, and the uh, PGE grade shows no correlation with chrome. So I'm not going to go into the geology in too much detail, um, but very quickly, it's made up of, sort of three broad units. So at the base, there's unit one, which are, consists of peridotites mainly, and then there's unit two, which are gabronorites and leucogabronorites, and then unit three, which are pigeonite gabronorites. And um, actually, the PGE grade in this deposit is not in the peridotites. Instead, it's in unit two, so in our gabronorites and leucogabronorites and also in leucogabronorite veins, which intrude into unit one. Um, there's also a small amount of calc talc overprint, uh, showing there has been some, some fluids present, and there are also rafts of calc silicates and calc silicate zenoliths within the deposit, showing that while it was being formed, it was assimilating um, probably something like a dolomite. And this is what the mineralization looks like. So it has a kind of classic, I guess, uh, magmatic sulphide assemblage, so pentandite, pyrotite, chalcopyrite. Not huge modal percentages of sulphides, um, but the sulphides are generally found as blebs in unit two and slightly more massive within our leucogabronorite veins. But one of the other interesting things about aurora is there's also secondary hydrothermal sulphides present. So these are pyrite chalcopyrite or um, pyrotite chalcopyrite, and they're hosted in hydrothermal alteration minerals, so in quartz, chlorite, or actinolite. And so we did laser ablation on these sulfides in order to see where our PGEs are being hosted. And so these um, values here are the average precious metal and semi-metal concentrations for the different sulfide types from this deposit. And the first thing I want to mention is if an element isn't, if a precious metal or semi-metal isn't listed here, that's because it was below detection limit. So actually palladium was the only platinum group element which was consistently above detection limit in sulfides. And then in that and then only really in pentlandite. So our platinum and our gold must be hosted somewhere else. And uh, the pentlandites have an average of 22 parts per million palladium. And actually, that's relatively low. So if we compare this to pentlandites in other deposits in the bushveld, uh, this is a histogram showing the concentration of palladium in pentlandite in the Morensky Reef in grey, uh, in the Platt Reef in blue, and then in Aurora in red here. And you can see that the pentlandites in Aurora have much less palladium in than those in the rest of the bushveld. And this, coupled with the low modal percentage of pentlandite in this deposit, means that our PG grade must be somewhere else. So I mean, there is PG grade here, it's a PG deposit, and this just means that our PGs must be in platinum group minerals, rather than necessarily in the sulfides. And indeed, that's the case. So um, I did a SEM survey and identified, thankfully, lots of platinum group minerals. And, but interestingly, it's very, very monomineralic. So actually 85% of the platinum group minerals in Aurora are Morenskyite, so palladium, tellurium, bismuth minerals. And there's also some electrum and some hessite there as well, which is where our gold and silver is sitting. And again, if we compare this to other deposits across the northern limb, this is slightly unusual. So um, 
These are, so this is a graph showing platinum group mineral types as a percentage of total platinum group mineral area in different deposits. So this is the Platte Reef, um, Aurora, and then Waterberg in the two mineralized zones in Waterberg, which are the F zone and the T zone. And so the Platte Reef, you can see, has a much broader range of platinum group mineral types in it than Aurora, as does the Waterberg F zone. And Aurora, in fact, is most similar to the Waterberg T zone, and I'll come back to that um, at the end. So not only that, not only is it unusually monomineralic, but actually when we started looking at where specifically these platinum group minerals are hosted, we found something else quite unusual. So if you remember at the beginning when I was talking about our sort of classic uh, magmatic sulphide deposit formation model, I said that the platinum group minerals, they exolve from the sulphide melt and therefore they should be within or around the sulphides. But actually in Aurora, only 25% of the platinum group minerals are in or touching uh, base metal sulphides. 23% of them are in sulphide uh, alteration halos like this one here. So they're hosted in quartz or chlorite or actinolite. Um, so away from sulphides, but within the same field of view and very much around the sulphides. But 52% of the platinum group minerals are completely spatially removed from the sulphides. So there are no sulphides within a field of view. Now at this point, I'm gonna say they're not spatially removed by meters. I'm sort of talking kind of <coughs> centimeter scale. Um, so on a sort of assay grade logging kind of scale, the, num the uh, PGE grade does correlate with sulphides. But on a thin section scale, the platinum group minerals are removed from the base metal sulphides. And this is quite unusual. Not only that, but we also see a difference in composition of our platinum group minerals based on what mineral they're hosted in. So this is a ternary diagram showing the bismuth, tellurium, and PGE concentration of Marenskyites uh, subdivided by what mineral they're hosted in. So the red dots here are hosted in sulphides. Uh, the blue dots are hosted are the ones which are removed from the sulphides and hosted in hydrothermal alteration minerals. And the green dots are those which are hosted in hydrothermal alteration minerals around the sulphides. And you can see that generally the Marenskyites which are hosted in hydrothermal alteration contain less bismuth than those which are hosted in the sulphides. And actually, looking at global data, this seems to hold true across a range of different deposits. So I did a compilation of Marenskyite data where the host mineral was specified. And again, the red dots here are those hosted in sulphides and the blue dots are those hosted in hydrothermal alteration minerals. And again, broadly, it looks like the Marenskyites hosted in hydrothermal alteration minerals contain less bismuth than those in the sulphides. Now, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure why this should be the case. However, one thing that it does show is that this hydrothermal alteration, it's not just physically moving the platinum group minerals, it's also changing their composition. And so this suggests that rather than just physically moving them, they're actually dissolving them and then re-precipitating them. And so our platinum group minerals are undergoing some kind of chemical change during that process. So we can start to sort of come up with a, a few genetic cartoons for how our different textures of platinum group minerals might have formed. So our sulfide hosted platinum group minerals, um, as I said at the beginning, um, we think here that it's just a case of they exolve from the sulfide melt and then as the system cooled, they crystallized as platinum group minerals in the sulfide melt. The ones which are hosted in this alteration halo, uh, this is seen in quite a lot of deposits actually and there's been some really nice work done by Dave Holwell and others at Leicester recently showing that actually late low temperature hydrothermal alteration of sulfides causes a volume loss. And so what happens is if you've got your uh, sulfide with your platinum group minerals in it and then a late hydrothermal fluid comes along and alters it, um, the, basically the sulfide shrinks and kind of strands your platinum group minerals in an alteration halo around it. But that still doesn't explain our spatially removed platinum group minerals. So what about the 52% of them which are nowhere near a sulfide? Um, this can't just be a case of volume loss because a lot of them are hosted within cracks in primary silicates um, and, as I said, well away from any base metal sulfides. And so the question is, is this secondary low temperature fluid remobilization or is this evidence of primary volatiles given off either as dolomite was assimilated or potentially primary magmatic volatiles? And so really the question here is, are we looking at a high temperature fluid or are we looking at a low temperature fluid? And actually, Aurora contains fluid inclusions. So having said I, I moved to the Bushveld to avoid fluid inclusions, it was not to be. Um, and so Aurora has fluid inclusions in quartz, and uh, these consist of brine and vapor inclusions. But I'm not going to talk about those today, because actually, Aurora also contains primary fluid inclusions in, cumulus, um, in cumulate magmatic silicates. 
So cumulus plagioclase and intercumulus orthoperoxine contain fluid inclusions, which I've interpreted as primary. They're not on uh, healed fractures. They tend to be aligned with growth zones. So I'm pretty confident that these are primary inclusions. And this is really exciting because it shows that not only were these volatiles around while these crystals were sort of crystallizing, but also it means we can see what the conditions of these fluids were. So what do they look like? Well, there are brine inclusions present, and in all of these, the sort of red boxes are photos of inclusions in um, intercumulus orthoperoxine, and the orange boxes are those in cumulus plagioclase. Unfortunately, the inclusions are really, really tiny, so uh, please forgive the quality of the photos here. Um, but um, so I've did some laser Raman and also optical microscopy work on them and found that these brine inclusions consist of water vapor, liquid water. Some of them actually showed a signature that looked a bit like liquid H2SO4. So these are really acidic fluids. Um, they contain multiple daughter minerals, always including halite, uh, often including sylvite. And then other daughter minerals include calcium or magnesium carbonate, uh, iron chloride, and sometimes even hematite. So this is a little trail of inclusions in an orthoperoxine where you can just about see a uh, hematite daughter mineral. So these are really, really saline. They're aggressive, they're highly acidic, um, and they're around while the system, probably around while the system was still partially molten. There are also vapor inclusions present, and these are carbon dioxide and methane inclusions, sometimes with a little film of carbon dioxide liquid around as well, and these are mostly common, most common in cumulus plagioclase, although there are a few in the intercumulus orthoperoxine as well. And there are also rare salt melt inclusions. So actually when I heated these up, uh, this guy melted bang on the melting point of halite, which is quite exciting. That's never happened to me in fluid inclusion studies before. Um, so I'm pretty confident that these are indeed salt melt inclusions. And so this is um, preliminary results from uh, microthermometry. So had a look at these on a high temperature stage. And uh, the red bars here are um, inclusions in intercumulus orthoperoxine, and the orange bars are inclusions in cumulus feldspar. And so the take-home message here is indeed these, these volatiles are very high temperature. So the primary inclusions, so the inclusions in our primary magmatic silicates, homogenize between 800 and 1,100 degrees C. So, and some of them actually homogenized around the solidus of their host mineral. So this means that these volatiles were definitely around while the system was still at least partially molten. And uh, as can be expected from the multiple daughter minerals, the brine inclusions are also very, very saline. So we're looking at sort of 60 to 80 weight percent NaCl. So what does this mean for our mineralization? Well, experimental work has shown that high temperature, high salinity, acidic fluids can carry PGEs and certainly can carry gold and copper and iron and other metals. And so, um, sorry, so our uh, theory is that you had your, uh, that during the deposit formation, you had our dolomite, little dolomite potato there, being assimilated, and as it was assimilated, it gave off volatiles which would be rich in carbon dioxide and calcium, potentially sodium and chlorine if there are any evaporite horizons present, and also some water. And then sort of the mean, the average uh, homogenization temperature is sort of around about 900 degrees C. And if you remember at the beginning, I said at that point, um, our, our iron and nickel portion of our sulfide melt would be crystalline, but our ISS, so our copper-rich sulfide liquid, would be at least partially molten. And certainly our semi-metal liquid, which is where our palladium and our gold is, um, as well as our bismuth and tellurium, would be liquid at this point. And so, um, so what I'm proposing is that these primary volatiles um, either dissolved or just moved this semi-metal liquid and potentially some of the ISS as well, remobilizing our PGEs away from the sulfides and then as the system cooled, precipitating them as palladium, bismuth, tellurium minerals in hydrothermal alteration. So I guess the other question is, if these volatiles were around while the system was still at least partially molten, what, what effect did this have on silicate chemistry? And so um, this is a SEM EDS map, uh, element map, of a gabbronorite sample from Aurora. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but um, so this is plagioclase and these are our pyroxenes. And the plagioclases show beautiful zoning, but they actually show reverse zoning. So the cores of the plagioclase here have a northlight numbers of, sort of between 68 and 73, while the rims have a northlight numbers of sort of 79 to sort of 80 ish. And this is quite unusual because you know, according to fractional crystallization, we should really be seeing it the other way around. It should be that the primitive anorthite numbers are in the core, and then it becomes more evolved as you go towards the rim. 
And so potentially what's happening here is if we have these calcium-rich volatiles around while the plagioclase is finishing crystallizing, it could be that this calcium is, uh, that calcium is being added from the fluid and giving us this reverse zoning. So going back to our initial question, so in Aurora, we do have evidence that there were primary volatiles present during the formation of this deposit. And it's likely that these primary volatiles remobilize the PGs away from the base metal sulfides. And so the question is, is this just a, an interesting local feature or have fluid inclusions been identified in cumulate silicates in any other layered intrusions? So we're now going to go to the other side of the world, um, going to America and to um, the Stillwater complex in Montana. And here, this is a layered ultramafic intrusion, much like the Bushveld, and um, the main mineralization here is the JM reef, which has been said to be sort of broadly similar to the Marensky reef. And Jake Hanley, a town in 2008, actually identified fluid inclusions in quartz, but also in orthoperoxene and olivine around the JM reef. And these inclusions consist of brine inclusions with lots of daughter minerals, and also carbon dioxide, methane, vapor inclusions. Um, and if these inclusion types are looking very familiar, uh, they did to me too, and they're very, very similar to what we were seeing in Aurora. And the brines, um, which are hosted in the olivine, for example, have homogenization temperatures as of up to 800 degrees C, so not quite as hot as we're seeing at Aurora, but still quite high temperature. And so the authors here interpreted these to be magmatic hydrothermal fluids. And there's actually been a lot of work done um, on the effect of, or potential effect of magmatic volatiles in the Stillwater complex. So another interesting feature of the Stillwater complex is that olivine reappears within the uh, anorthosite and gabbronorite sequence. So higher up in the stratigraphy than you would necessarily expect. And so again, sort of going by classic um, fractional crystallization, you would expect by the time you're getting to a gabbronorite and anorthosite sequence, you'd expect your olivine to have all crystallized out, unless you have a new melt injection, which there isn't evidence for in the Stillwater complex. Now, there are lots of theories as to why this might be, so I will say at this point that this is just one of them, but um, Alan Boudreau and others have done a, a lot of work on this, and actually modeling showed that it only takes a very, very small amount of water added to a gabbronorite melt in order to create metasomatic olivine. So um, through this so equation down here, if you add only sort of so 0.2% of water, and you can start to generate olivine. And these olivines are late, so they tend to be sort of intercumulus and show reaction textures with the surrounding orthoperoxene. And so the, the theory that um, Alan and others came up with is that you have your uh, lower anorthosites, and these degas and uh, give off a magmatic vapor, and then this magmatic vapor reacts with your gabbronorite melt in order to give sort of metasomatic troctolites if you will. Now, as I said, this is just one theory, um, but, it, um, but yeah, it's quite interesting showing how the presence of water in these ultramafic systems can drastically change the mineralogy. Um, interestingly, they also see reverse zoning of plagioclase in, uh, in the, uh, the gabbronorites in still water. And again, um, Alan did some modeling in melts, uh, which I, I must, I've been playing with recently, but isn't really my forte, so please don't ask me loads of questions about this bit. Um, but essentially, they showed that, once again, you can get reverse zoning of plagioclase through metasomatic reactions. Now, one of the interesting things about the Stillwater complex is actually there are no reactive country rocks around there, so it doesn't intrude any dolomites. Um, and so these authors are saying that, actually, all of the volatiles in Stillwater are primarily magmatic volatiles. And this begs the question of, actually, do we really need a reactive country rock in order to produce volatiles in layered ultramafic intrusions. So we know that we see it in Aurora in the northern limb. We know that we see, that we see primary volatiles in the Stillwater complex. So what about the rest of the bushveld? Well, as I mentioned, there's been um, a fair amount of work looking at fluid inclusions in quartz in the bushveld. Uh, so for example, uh, Schifferies in 1990, Ballhaus and Stumpf, apologies for my uh, pronunciation, and Zatova et al. Um, looked at fluid inclusions in quartz and pegmatite around the Marensky Reef. Now, these aren't in primary magmatic silicates. Um, I'm not, not entirely sure of the relationship of the quartz. Um, but again, these are brine and vapor inclusions, so CO2, CH4 vapor inclusions, and multi daughter mineral brine inclusions with um, quite high homogenization temperatures. So, again, very, very similar to the types of inclusions that we're seeing in Aurora. 
So, what about the rest of the northern limb? So, as I said, we've got the Aurora project up here. And actually, having, said, um, having talked about the troctolites in the Stillwater complex, there's also a troctolite unit in the main zone of the northern limb. So, the main zone, uh, the upper main zone, which is um, gabbronorites mainly, um, has a troctolite unit in it which can be traced along strike of the northern limb. And Bianca Kennedy, who's actually just handed in her PhD at Cardiff University, um, she's been doing a lot of work on this, so the next couple of slides are her work. And so Bianca um, has logged it and found that actually the troxolite unit also contains PGE mineralization. Um, and that broadly, this can be correlated with a spike in the olivine, um, in the modal mineral percentage, sorry, the modal percentage of olivine um, in this troxolite unit. And the olivines have a really interesting texture. So again, this is an element map from our SEM, and olivine is in green and plagioclase is in blue. And you can see these olivines are really, really weird looking. So um, they're almost interstitial, and they contain inclusions of plagioclase and these sort of embayments and kind of reaction textures with the surrounding plagioclase. And so we've suggested that potentially this is showing that this olivine is the result of metasomatism. So much like was suggested uh, for the troctolites in the Stillwater complex, here we're suggesting that this late intercumulus olivine is due to reaction between volatiles and the melt. And actually, whenever we looked a little bit closer, um, we found that these olivines also contain fluid inclusions, um, including brine inclusions. And there are also fluid inclusions in the surrounding plagioclases and orthoperoxine. Having, having, uh, having talked to Bianca, I then realized that actually there's olivine gabbronorites in Aurora, which I'd been completely ignoring. Um, so I went back and had a look at them. And once again, we see olivine with this weird kind of anhedral texture, again, almost looking into cumulus. Um, and whenever I looked closer at the olivines, lo and behold, there are brine inclusions present in these olivines as well. And so the next question, I guess, is what about the plat reef? Because there's a lot of calc silicate zenless um, within the plat reef. And again, um, so these are photos from Eva Marquise's um, ME side thesis uh, from Cardiff University. And again, you've got these anhedral kind of what I've called interstitial um, olivine textures. And so it'd be interesting to see if there are any fluids there as well. So what we're proposing is that actually the presence of these sort of so-called interstitial olivines might well be an indicator for the presence of primary um, volatiles in layered ultramafic intrusions. And so we see this, um, so we see these olivine textures in the plat reef, we see these olivine textures in the troxolite unit, and we also see fluid inclusions in those olivines. We see these olivine textures in aurora, and we see fluid inclusions in the olivine there. And so the next question is, what about Waterberg uh, to the north? Um, again, there are some quite interesting anhedral olivine textures there. Um, and so the question is, are there fluid inclusions there as well? And actually, so the interesting thing about Waterberg, so this is a, a, um, a cross-section adapted from one published by uh, Judith and Ian recently, um, showing Aurora here and the Waterberg uh, deposit here. And so the T-zone of the Waterberg deposit could potentially be an along strike equivalent of the mineralization at Aurora. Now, this is still very unsure. We're not quite sure how this correlation works. Um, but it's interesting that actually um, Matt McCreesh's work showed that the platinum group minerals in the T-zone are predominantly palladium tellurium bismuth minerals, much like aurora. And actually, a lot of them are hosted in hydrothermal alteration minerals, so in quartz, so much like what we see at aurora. Um, so actually, one of, the, one of the reasons I'm here at the moment is to have a little look at the Waterberg and working with Judith and Marina, where hopefully going to try and get to the bottom of this and see if similar processes might have been um, occurring in Waterberg as we see in Aurora. So going back to our original three questions, are primary volatiles present during the formation of magmatic sulfide nickel copper PGE deposits in layered intrusions? Well, so far we've identified primary volatiles as fluid inclusions um, in Aurora in the troxolite unit uh, they've been identified in Stillwater, Montana, and then depending on how many arguments you want to have about the relationship of quartz with the Marensky Reef, potentially also um, elsewhere in the bush belt. What effect does this have on mineralization? Well, these are high temperature, high salinity, very aggressive acidic fluids, and so these could have remobilized PGEs and other precious metals as well. 
these fluids are around while these systems were still at least partially molten, and at Aurora, certainly, we see that they have indeed remobilized our precious metals. And so finally, what are the implications for exploration and processing? Well, there are clear processing implications. So for example, at Aurora, the PGEs are not with the sulfides, which means when you're doing sulfide separation, um, your PGE is actually gonna end up in your gang mainly, which is obviously a bit of an issue. Um, and also, now that we know that these primary volatiles can remobilize PGEs, this could be potentially grade destructive. So if you have a really large volume of fluid flow through a deposit, it could strip your precious metals out almost entirely. The flip side of that is it also provides a source for hydrothermal PGE deposits. So for example, the Waterberg deposit in the Eastern Bushveld or the Sudbury footwall deposits, um, these are distill deposits away from um, magmatic sulfides where the platinum group elements are hosted in hydrothermal alterations. So potentially, these primary volatiles could be a source mechanism for those. Um, and, but I think probably the main sort of practical takeaway of this is that country rock type and proximity to xenoliths could be really, really important for grade control, particularly when mining large-scale deposits like something like, for example, the Platte Reef. And as I said, um, we'd like to propose that potentially interstitial olivine could be an indicator for the presence of primary volatiles in these systems. However, there are still a lot of questions. Um, so first of all, as I said, the Stillwater complex, there are no reactive country rocks around at all. Whereas in the northern limb, we do have the presence of calc silicates. And so are these volatiles from reactive country rock assimilation or are they from magmatic degassing? Now I suspect it's probably an and both rather than an either or, but the question is, do you need reactive country rocks in order to have enough volatiles to remobilize metals. Um, and this has important implications for exploration because if, if you don't need them, if any layered ultramafic intrusion could have a large volume of volatiles going, primary volatiles going through it, then that has obvious implications um, for magmatic sulfide deposits around the world. And then that leads on to the second question, which is how widespread actually are these primary volatiles? Are high temperature brines actually present in every layered intrusion? And it's just that they're really, really tiny and we haven't really been looking for them. So I guess if I was going to sum this up in one sentence, I would say primary volatiles can remobilize metals in layered intrusion hosted nickel copper PGE deposits and are probably a lot more common than we think. So thank you very much and uh, any questions. Katie, thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Can we open it up to questions? So I was going to ask, just to follow on Lou, um, so, so some of these, there are parts of the bush belt that Hannah was working on, for example, where these things were popping out of the wall rock because of methane. And, and I think that was what Lou was, was mentioning. There's obviously a lot of methane in some of these inclusions, whether they're primary magmatic ones or whether the methane accumulated there at some later point, I'm not sure. But, but it would seem that if you're getting 
thirds that are overpressuring and decrepitating fluid inclusion as a result of internal, this is must be a huge amount of, if you, of methane in addition to maybe some of the other things, uh, other volatiles that are in the fluid phases as well. But uh, that was just a comment. I just wanted to ask, um, if these are primarily magmatic volatiles and you're having sulfide saturation as well, what is the relationship in time between sulfide saturation and volatile saturation? And is it ever likely that they might actually be coeval so that the, so that the fluid, the aqueous fluid and, and the sulfide melt are actually competing at the same time for the budget of PGMs that are in the magma? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question and something I would love to know. I think it's very possible. I mean, certainly looking at the temperatures um, of the fluid inclusions, I would expect there to be sulfide melt around at that time. Um, certainly ISS would be molten. I don't know about MSS. I mean, some of the really high molten temperatures maybe. And then that begs the question of if you have a sulfide melt and you have a really highly saline acidic aggressive volatile, which one does the PV want to go into? Well, which, well I guess which one does gold want to go into? Which one does palladium want to go into? Because I, I think there is partitioning data uh, from people like um, um, uh, Anthony Lewis uh, Williams. Yeah, so I think there is partition data that would be quite useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very good comment because that's similar to what Stephen was saying, structure and the relationship to local jointing. So please join us for that. Thank you very much.